Greetings and salutations on the lovely individuals of this lovely planet. Eric and Mark here with you guys for another epi of League Unlock. It is week two slash three, if you're including LEC, domestic power rankings today to get through three of the major regions. We're approaching being able to do some global rankings as the LPL gets more games under their belt. But today we are starting in the LCS and... Again, another week, if you watch the games, the bottom half of the teams don't make me feel great about the power level in NA. It, it makes you feel pretty thankful that we've got eight teams in the LCS instead Oof. of maybe 10 to be rolling through. Although I think it'd be a pretty safe bet that these squads would find themselves down in that type of position as well. What we're looking at with Dignitas, I don't think we've seen really this experiment or, or trial to prop up a player like rich in the top side we haven't seen that explosiveness we haven't seen dove really have uh, the effect you want for the team in, in the, that regard and you look at immortals and there still is some figuring out still is some working out for that team but i, I think the overall potential is very clearly lower than what we're seeing with other lcs squads so far and truthfully i think a guy like castle has come in and been better than advertised coming into this. Even a guy like Tactical, who gets memed to no end, has had some solid performances. And I know both IMT and Dig, they were competitive. They had leads against 100 Thieves and Team Liquid respect, uh, respectively, but that to me is more, I don't feel very good about 100 T or Team Liquid right now either. Yeah, and that's the other part of the conversation that needs to come through for the LCS is sure you can look at that bottom and be comfortable in figuring out what is the bottom of the LCS. But then as you try to rise up from that and hope to see more signs of life, more signs of that competitiveness you want towards a playoff picture, you're not really getting it so far at the very least from 100 Thieves. And then you look at Team Liquid as well, where you might have that expectation even further so to be better, to be looking more complete and we're not still seeing that overall from the squad. We're, you know, in terms of just meta picks for both APA and Yawn, not looking super comfortable. Um, the Aphelios Yawn looks comfortable on, but we've seen lots of other picks. He's a little bit uh, wishy-washy. And then sandwiched in between all those squads, you talk about the Shopify Rebellion, who even though they had the 0-2 start, we were feeling better about them than IMT and Dig. And then, of course, they get the big upset against Cloud9. You can talk about disrespect when it comes to drafting out of Cloud9. But Shopify, shoutouts to them. They earned that win. The execution was there from Shopify. You can't take that away from them. I think what you've seen throughout this run and again, how you know steady they have been, even despite the record that has been shown out, you got to be giving them some credit in what they're doing. I think this past week we had, you know, B-Boy step in and relatively looked like a good upgrade from what we had with Wild Turtle. And that is saying something given the expectation was that Wild Turtle was going to be a better option than what B-Boy was providing one week. I know, you know, you can't come to full conclusions on that type of situation, but at least when you're looking in that middle pack of the LCS, I think a team like Shopify Rebellion is one you can identify out as seeing a little more potential. And potentially being able to leapfrog over these squads like Team Liquid and 100 Thieves, who a lot of teams are still kind of leveling up in these early days of the regular season. And you're holding out hope for the current top three that they can continue to level up and at least be something you're okay sending power level wise internationally by North America standards. Got to preface it with that. But NRG, you're feeling very good about after that matchup against FlyQuest. Uh, obviously, who he picks up player of the week honors. He had some dominant performances, but across the board, NRG, they completely dismantle FlyQuest. Seemed to have a good read on uh, the meta picks, the Ivern came in and just completely took this game over. Oh, baby, El Contracto showing up and making sure the rest of these players, and especially someone like Inspired that took that year off, are reminded of what the current landscape of the LCS jungle is, and that is with contracts near that tippity top of how he's performing. This is great from NRG. It certainly was that answer that the NRG of last year, it's still going to be here because you had pretty much those four members that are returning all popping off, all providing that type of value that we've seen from them with NRG. And on top of that, you had who he contributing, as you mentioned, player of the game. 
this was one of those ones where you really did feel the progression from last year to this year and realized not, okay, maybe a Cloud9 upgraded, maybe FlyQuest retooled, but NRG are the reigning champions and they got an upgrade for how they want to play in the bot lane as well. Got to give that consideration. Amazing to see defending champs still playing with a chip on their shoulder. And you've heard their own players talking about in these teasers. Somehow we're still not the best team in NA, even though we won the split and made top eight at Worlds. That's the kind of disrespect uh, that this squad is getting. But they're still not in that top spot because despite that Cloud9 loss, the other games they've looked so dominant, and they still have that head-to-head -head day one win against NRG, still enough for them to sit pretty in the top spot. Still enough to sit top in the league right now at the LCS and what we're looking at and how they play. Yes, we're excusing that match against Shopify Rebellion. I think a lot of people can easily have predicted that we would have seen something like that from this Cloud9 team uh, as far as, you know, the poor decision making or just really the overconfidence in some of this decision making and disrespect towards your opponent and what you were doing. We could have seen that happening maybe, you know, week three, week four, week five, whatever in the LCS. We're talking about it in week two is a little bit more of an issue for cloud nine but still have done enough strong things to say that they are without a doubt for me still that top option in the lcs and of course still very early but the comms with uh vulcan and jojo coming in they seem a lot more calm cool and collected than most of the other teams that we've seen so far in the lcs which we know is an integral part to finding success as a squad final week of regular season in the LEC, we got the playoff picture sorted out. But first, we rank those top 10 heading into that next round. And all it took was the 0 and 7 power spike to be already eliminated. And finally, Carmine Corp comes alive. After losing to Rogue, they still get a bump up from the bottom of the cellar because they get that big win against BDS and a win before that. Those last two games, they looked like a completely different team. They finally start to execute on some of the plays they've been trying, kind of simplify things down a little bit as well. It's a whole journey is what it's going to be for K-Corp. It's one of those ones where you look at how the situation plays out and how much time you're going to have off between these splits now is one of the biggest worries about losing and dropping out at this point in time. It's going to be one of those ones we're going to have a lot of time to talk about and really dissect and how things are going to go for them. But at the very least, there is some sunshine to the end of this split for this team k corp and i think as well we can acknowledge even throughout all this downtime the hype has still been there from the k corp fans annoying whatever you want to call them they have been passionate about their team and about this debut in the lec at least that little bit of positivity at the end probably enough for a couple guys to keep their starting jobs coming into the spring split who knows what their roster or what rogue is going to be looking like heading into that spring split. Uh, the big drop of the week is a 0-3 run from Team Heretics. And Mark, I hate to say it, but back-to-back -back games, Mr. Perks in the mid lane, that Akali performance, and then for how long Azir has been meta. This guy's been playing Azir for seven years, and he, the ultimates, the dashes in, in place, he looked all out of sorts this entire week. It's, it's really unfortunate, but those are the type of games that, that prove the memes that are out there. But my Azir is bad, my Rise is worse. Oh man, EU perks. Yes, my man for Heretics has had a rough go of it recently. And I think it's one of those situations where I still got lots of faith in the player that he has proved himself to be over the course of his career. The recency in what we have seen and specifically the role that he has to play on this Heretics roster that ain't gonna run those type of performances. You gotta have a step up into this next round or else it is out so donezo for Mr. Heretics. And, and he doesn't need to be playing 2018 RNG upset LeBlanc 1v9 performance. We just need middle of the pack level mid lane performance for them to be playing better. And that isn't what we were getting this week, but you're right, best ofs roll around. Obviously these veterans have a chance to turn it around, but not feeling great about them heading into playoffs. Team Vitality stays put uh, in that number seven spot. They had uh, some crazy games this week. Uh, Hill is saying, usually we see him on Pike and it's an absolute treat, but he was getting smashed around by Mad Lions Koi on that. Blitzcrank hooks greater than Pike hooks is what we learned. Oh, you know, it's a tough one. Normally I feel pretty good about seeing a Pike demolished like that, but 
man, Hillisang's Pike hits different, and you want to see that one. Find the success, find those crazy plays. It wasn't the case this past week. I think when you're talking about vitality, this is a team that still has a chance to try and show that extra little bit of horsepower, a little more firepower to push towards that top end of the LEC. Heading into these best of series, this is where you start to try and really crank up the heat and see what these teams can offer you in the LEC. This is where you want to see teams really explode from what we have already seen to start out the year. And the squad that beat them to close out the regular season, Mad Lions, they're the ones cooking the most in this league, especially in that top lane. We talked about it in the preseason. Mirwin busting out the Varus top, and we got to see the pocket pick fiddlesticks. Even though it ended up not being a win, it had massive impacts across the board, and this guy is making top lane fun again. And I think that's one that we're going to actually see continue on through is that fiddlesticks. I think that's one to keep an eye on throughout this meta and what's going to be changing. But yes, they are getting a dose of some fresh air thanks to Mr. Mirwin up at the top side for this Mad Lions Koi, which I got to say, Early indications are that this experiment, this run of the young guns with Elioya as your leader, that extra responsibility, it's all worked out for the team. You can see the role and the effect and how motivated this player is, how invested he is even on stage and around his teammates. You can tell that this is his squad. He feels some pride in that, some responsibility in helping these young players up. And absolutely, these young players, more than good enough to step up to that table is what we are seeing in the LEC. I mean, how about Supa and Alvaro going toe-to-toe, -to -toe, 2v2 with pretty much every bot lane in the league so far? They have been an absolute focal point of this squad. The rookies are definitely all right when you're talking about Mad Lions, Koi. Uh, top four action, SK yeah, is maybe the toughest team for me to grade because on any given week, you were feeling like 3-0 start. This guy's beat Fnatic, look like the best team in the league. Then they go drop a couple of games to teams that they should be beating. And then they do that again in week three. So I wouldn't be surprised if this team goes deep towards finals or loses in the first round. It is that mixed bag. You have no idea what you're going to be getting from this SK team towards that next level. And that is where these best of series provide a little more opportunity for consistency to try and prove that you can do it all in that one day and show up and be that team. Looking at a player like Niski, what we've been getting from Irrelevant, what the rest of this team, Exekick, has been able to provide is firepower. It's been enough for this team to be a top option in the LEC. It's just got to go right for them on the day, and I think we're going to be proving whether they can summon that at will or not type of situation when we get into these best of, situ uh, best of round. Just feel like the potential ceiling for a squad like Fnatic is still higher than any of these five and four four and five squads even though they dropped a couple games this week Fnatic still comes on top of that very contested middle of the pack in the lec yeah and especially because really for me it has been the play of humanoid all the way through this split is that big storyline i want to follow through with this team i think you can even talk a little bit about the bot lane and how they've kind of matured a little bit in their own right and developing their own synergy and communication is a big part of it course replacing that support role and that communication is such a big part of what's going to go on so we're still waiting to see a little bit more of that with Fnatic but with Humanoid leading the way the way he is so far that is a strong option heading into these best of series and directly related to his performance because he did get caught out in classic Humanoid fashion a couple <laughs> times this week which for more used to uh, and then you know Razork has stepped more into that communicator role it seems like with Trimby not in the lineup G2 and BDS are the obvious 1-2 punch at the end of the regular season, tied at that 7-2 and two record, but a 3-0 closeout for G2 is enough for them to retake that top spot. Plus, you're giving them that slight little buff that is G2 in best of series. Yeah, and I think the way that they climbed through their best of series this past weekend really was that solidifying option for me to just make sure they're ahead of a squad like BDS and how they've done it. You're looking at caps on that Akali, the clutch factor, making sure that he's getting it done. These type of things are all the reasons why you would put a G2 ahead of a BDS. That's not meant to put down a team like BDS and what we have seen from them, our challenge to this team heading into this split after everything that happened last year was to retool, to re-see a lot of other parts of this lineup step up to the level that Adam was contributing and being an, uh, an option, an outlet for power for this team. And I think we've seen a lot of those improvements so far from this team. And 
like last year throughout playoff runs, we were seeing Broken Blade one trick in a cled throughout all these series. He pulls out the Vladimir this week. Who knows? This guy likes to get a pick and run with it, especially through best ofs until he forces out a ban. Maybe we're looking at the Vlad in this playoff run. It could be. It could very well be. Maybe uh, maybe something space, special and spicy for old Merwin to step up and get his own little uh-huh. counter pick into it. Now we're talking about some and heat in the LEC top. Four. Broken Blade loves to steal picks from other guys, too. All of a sudden, he sees Adam. He says, ah, I'm an Olaf trick. One trick now. I'm a <laughs> Fiddlesticks main now. We're going to see him playing Varus all the time. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. Bring it on. Varus top, Bane top. He's saying, hot Sama, I can do it a little bit better than you, brother. But feeling good about both G2 and BDS heading into this next round of action in the LEC. LCK, week two behind us. And, of course, you know, getting more and more familiar with the bottom of the table in the LCK. We got the Titanic matchup of DRX versus Bro this week. Match of the week, right? <laughs> Oh, man, the unstoppable five check me the immovable force of DRX versus bro. Uh, this is one where I think we've seen glimpses. I'll be cautious glimpses from this DRX squad that there's something that they could build towards or whatever. Now we have seen glimpses and way too many glimpses of unfortunate errors from this squad as well as one of the things to keep track of. And when you're matching up against the bros and you're hoping that you bring your very best on the day, you're at a different territory than the rest of this LCK power rankings we're going to talk about. But luckily, one bottom four squad, bottom five squad is separating from the pack because the Lord and Savior two times, two bulls on the Kwang Dong Freaks. Both steps in for Taehyun. They get the big upset against KT Rolster. They look like a different squad with him in at 80 carry. They followed up with another series win, which means they kick Nangshim down a t- couple of spots and move into that sixth spot. I mean, this is only good for LCK fans to see this Kwang Dong Freaks roster really start to figure it out, pick up a little momentum, pick up that traction to be a challenging squad to put away, even for the top teams in the LCK, is going to be a good thing. We talked a lot about this would be one of the teams that you got to keep an eye on and how they're developing, what's going on, and specifically a player like Bulldog. And you can add, you know, as well to the bot lane as well, another Bulldog in that situation. But you got to keep an eye on them because this is certainly a team that I think is going to continuously improve in this LCK split. And a team that can knock on this top five, especially when you have KT faltering a little bit. They That head-to-head loss to Kwangdong really gets them kind of even on this pack here. And Hanwha Life even stand put at three and one, but they were completely destroyed top to bottom every single position by T1. That combined with D-plus playing such a good one and a half one in two thirds games against Gen G is enough for them to go top three, even though they have a worse record than Hanma. It, it was one of those situations where at the beginning of this, you know, play out of, of time for the LCK in 2024, we had it where you had such an incredible top, but then an um, embarrassing bottom of the league is the way that it looked out. It has all sorted itself out to be kind of, you know, finding that middle tier once again. And as you talked about, that's where you find these teams, KT Rolster, Kwang Young Freaks trying to hang it around. Hanwha Life is just on that edge, pushing up into that territory to try and get themselves out of it. Not enough at given their performance against T1. I think it is that indication of that clear separation of the tiers of the LCK. And we were feeling s- perfect game score, 6-0 and for Hanwha in their first three series, but they hadn't been tested against some of the better squads in the LCK. But I was really hyped for that T1 matchup, and they were, they were clearly not ready. Uh, this is like going way too early to the Elite Four in Pokemon, and you say, man, my Pokemon, they're 20 <laughs> levels lower. I, I can't do this. I, I just want to, I don't know what Pokemon is, is you know, Ze- Zekka's Corky, but I don't want to see that Pokemon out of the box anytime soon type of situation is one you got to go back to that drawing board. Yes, enough positives from Hanwha Life that you can put them in this territory that you can say there are things to build off of and everything else. This was certainly quite a, a substantial knockdown from the defending world champions in T1. And because Genji still has that head-to-head week one win against T1, they survive. As much as we praise D-plus for being so good for so much of that series, it was still Genji who came back from the brink and then had a dominant third game performance and really still feel like we're waiting uh, for Canyon to kind of fully find his role within this squad. I think Keen has had a better start than anticipated on Genji, but Canyon is 
he's just warming up the wheels it feels like and it's it's crazy you're going through the checklist for gen g and especially a checklist for gen g that is you know our top team in the lck and a lot of it right near the top you'd be having that one that's asking you to check off canyon doing canyon things in the jungle for his new squad but we quite haven't seen that yet you're looking at what you have gotten you've gotten great performances out of chovy in the mid lane pays has been there with the damage stepping in and through the sophomore season as you mentioned Mr. Keen has done his job in that top side, been better than advertised, I think, compared to the past couple of years on what he's been able to accomplish so far. Just wait on that last angle to see the full lethal deadly threat of Gen G is Canyon coming online. And I think we forget that, you know, we're just kind of expecting Pays Lehens to be a solid bot lane, one of the best in the LCK, but Pays when you're a rookie it's still you feel like you need more time to adapt to a new support because he had the full year with delight and we said delight was right there with kiria in terms of best support for the majority of that year and now lehens comes in and we know lehens likes to talk and banter a little bit with his ad carry so i'm expecting this bot lane to continue to level up as well so the 4-0 start for gen g i feel like they're only going to be getting better yeah, that bot lane has not missed a beat is the way you look at Pei's development and how he continues to play and, de and develop that chemistry alongside his support, bring the hands not only into him as that ADC support duo, but as well as bringing the hands into the environment of Gen G, bringing him along as that teammate, that member. This is a big part of it. This team, I think when we look at Canyon and wait on the you know Canyon effect to really take into the LCK to the team like Gen G, we're waiting a little bit here, but part of that is on that champion pick, and it's kind of hard for my man to do it when he's playing Maokai most of the time. It's, you know, so many changes this offseason heading into Korea, and only a couple weeks in, but the storyline's still developing, same as what it feels like it's been for two years. Can the rest of the teams level up to Gen G and T1, or are we left with them again going for a deep playoff run? It's the greatest rivalry in Korea right now, so I don't think either of us would be mad if that's end up how it playing out. But that's it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you beautiful people. As always, thanks for hanging out, and we will catch you on that flippity flip.